Mm. Ah, I love that. <laughs> then, um, so this way, other people who couldn't make it today will be able to have access points to this recording. But if the recording is problem for you, please just give me a chat so I can delete your name or something like that afterwards. All right. So I'm going to invite Tisidra as a first speaker, and I will mute myself and then hand it over to you. Thank you, Tisidra. Thank you very much. Well, hello to everybody. Although I cannot see you, thank you for joining us. And I'll imagine we're sharing space in one way or another. Uh, so again, my name is Tasidra Jones and I, I tend not to do a, a lengthy introduction in terms of myself, uh, but I will share a few things. And so first and foremost, uh, as much as my area relates to contracts, I'm here really to talk about relationships. And I'll say more about that and how I think about contracts and relationships. And for a moment, I would encourage you to just kind of think about um, a few of your relationships, whether it's business, personal, romantic. We often have the best intentions when we start a relationship, but sometimes things go awry. And I encourage you to think about a time where something didn't really quite go as planned. And what were the factors that contributed to that? And for me, what I've found in my life, whether we're talking about contracts or relationships generally, sometimes that's a matter of communication and sometimes it's a matter of a few other things. But the truth is, I think a lot of us start with the best intentions, but sometimes something breaks down a relationship. And that's really what I'm here to talk about today is how to navigate that and how to be proactive potentially as opposed to reactive. Um, so in terms of me, first and foremost, I'm a human being. I like to start with that. Uh, we wear so many different hats and titles that I just want to name that I'm a human, first and foremost. I think we can forget that with all the hats that we have. After that, in terms of the different identities and intersections I have that I think will be relevant for today. Uh, I am an artist. I was an artist before I was anything else as a child. Uh, and outside of that, I'm a business owner a community educator, and I also happen to be a lawyer. And so in the way in which I'll be talking about contracts today will be a mix of my experiences across those different hats uh, to share with you some stories of things that I've experienced, things that I've seen uh, for clients uh, and some stuff I've heard from others <laughs> and to give you tangible examples that connect to some of the things that I'm talking about. So in terms of our flow for the day, we're gonna get through this introduction and in the spirit of relationship building and communication, start off by getting on the same page, literally with a few things and then take the bulk of the time that I have together with you today to really talk about just a few terms and clauses within contracts to be able to keep in mind as you look at your own contracts, navigate your business and your art and working with others. And then just end with like two to three resources that might be useful for you in this space. And so getting on the same page and the mindsets and language. Uh, so in terms of folks that I tend to work with most in terms of my business uh, and outside of business, uh, it's really largely government entities a lot of the times within their contracting procurement related offices and contract compliance, as well as with those working within arts and culture. And something that I hear really often when I'm working with artists and creatives and arts organizations, a lot of people have this discussion when they talk about being transactional versus relational. And I'll hear folks going back and forth on that, like I'm really a relational person and I wanna be able to keep it light and think about that. And so I do wanna, as somebody who also really values relationships, I wanna kind of poke at that mindset just a little bit, the transactional versus relational, and really encourage you to think about contracts as a tool to really help relationships when communication can break down. It's not to make your relationship so rigid and transactional, but it's really a tool to say, hey, this is what I'm thinking. Is this what you're also thinking? And just as the image has here, it's a matter of perspective sometimes. Something that I say a lot with my teams is we could all be speaking English, but have a different kind of English that we're speaking. We could each have different images or movies playing in our mind. When we use one word, it can have a different weight for somebody in a different way. And so being able to have a contract in place where you've sat down, you agree to what's happening could really allow for you to have this tool that ensures on the front end before anything happens that, hey, we agree to what's here, we're on the same page. These words, these clauses mean the same thing for me as it does for you. And I'm not saying that I'm imagining the worst case scenario will happen, but I just wanna make sure that if anything goes off track, that at least on the front end, we had this conversation and we now have this tool to help us navigate it. And so that's just, that's a way that I think about contracts as a means of 
relationships, being able to get through bumpy paths without having to argue, well, you said this or you said that. And you can just say, hey, let's look at this document. And so really thinking about it as a tool to help in terms of navigating what may be bumpy paths within a relationship. In addition, really, I one of the reasons I went to law school, um, I spent my childhood watching a ton of documentaries, often about artists and artists who, a lot of times artists of color, who have gone through, they came up with these great, brilliant artistic creations, but ended up going through their life or dying penniless or having lots of their materials taken or stolen. And what I found in each of those movies as a kid, I would sit and watch and just realize like, a lot of times there wasn't a contract in place. There wasn't any intellectual property protection. There weren't things there that would have allowed them to protect what they were creating in those relationships. And for me, that was a driver in going to law school is I wanna make sure people keep their promises. If you say you're gonna pay somebody, pay them. <laughs> if you say we're gonna do these things, do these things. If I said, I'm gonna create this thing and give it to you, and then you're gonna use it, let's do that. And so for me, in addition to thinking, as a, thinking of it as a communications tool, I also think about contracts as a, a tool to keep promises. And so those are just a few things in terms of my mindset and language around how I think about contracts that I wanna offer to you all, as well as you think about your work and your interaction with others and contracts not necessarily being a scary thing, but something that's there to keep promises, keep pathways of communication clear and use it as a tool to ensure that as you move forward, you're on the same page. Um, and so before going any further and in the spirit of relationship building and open communication, although I cannot see you, I feel like we're on a journey for this hour together. Um, I, I want to say something that's often a little awkward to say, but I got to say it. And this is it's not you. It's the, the lawyer in me um, to say session does not constitute legal advice, nor does it create an attorney client relationship. So I just want to put that out there again. It's not you. It's just the lawyer in me that wanted to make sure I got that out there in the spirit of transparency and open communication. Uh, the other thing that I found when having this awkward moment of a disclaimer is that when you put a smiley face on something, it makes it all light and fun. So <laughs> as much as we're talking about contracts and lawyering and this topic that can be really boring or difficult for people to want to sit and listen to, I add a smiley face because it just makes things better. So now that we've gotten those pieces out of the way, I wanna take some time to talk about some terms and clauses within contracts that I've seen often um, and that have created opportunities, challenges, or barriers for others. And so what are some important sections to keep in mind? First, something that's really important for me in the way that I, I work and work with people and the projects that we take on within our consulting firm is really thinking about how we're creating infrastructure that can lead to more people thriving. And so when we work with government entities around programs and policies um, and, and terms that they have, we're really looking at ensuring that there aren't barriers that are being created or challenges for folks. And so in that we have this broader lens of how, how we work with people to ensure more people, more communities could thrive, really thinking about the economic side of things and ensuring at a baseline, people are able to get their income and be able to pay their bills. And those things are important. And that's a really big part when I wanna talk about first and foremost as kind of a funnel to some other clauses. So I wanna start with talking about compensation and invoicing. And so in starting here, we have contracts, you do great work, and then you want to get paid. That's kind of how, how it flows generally. But sometimes things don't really work out quite as we have planned. So I want to talk about with these four bubbles that I have here, some examples of what clauses may look like, but also some real life examples of where things kind of broke down in an effort to help you think about, oh, maybe I don't want to do this and I want to keep this in mind. Uh, so first, I want to start with payment schedules. So Every contract that I have that I put out there for folks that we work with, as well as most of the ones for people that the contracts that I've received to be a, a client for entities, larger entities, other nonprofits, um, will have some kind of section related to payment schedules. And so that's something that I think most people, yeah, you're going to look at compensation, make sure you're getting paid what you said you're going to get paid, and then some bit of payment schedules. I want to highlight the payment schedules piece because in looking at different contracts that I've received over the years or working with, again, say government entities or larger nonprofits that work, especially those working in areas related to creative placekeeping and cultural districts, will have terms in their contracts related to um, the time in which they'll pay. So the payment schedules may say that we would pay you within 30 days, 35 days, 90 days. And some say things like within a reasonable time. If you see that, I have lots of things to say to you, um, but <laughs> We'll start with the, the 30, the 90, 
or within a reasonable time. So why payment schedules are so important to me to highlight for you all at this point is that in working with artists, some artists don't necessarily think about themselves as business owners, but I do encourage you to think about the fact that you're providing a service, you're doing something, delivering something, and the money that's going to come in your compensation, that's going to impact your ability to pay, whether it's your business bills or your individual bills. And sometimes people don't think about that cash flow. And so if you have a payment schedule in a contract that's saying they're going to pay you in 90 days and you have other people you need to pay, is that reasonable? Does that really work for you? And is that a space to have a conversation? And I use 90 days as an example because there was a period in time, a number of um, government entities that we had worked with had that kind of 60 to 90 day turn time. But I would also encourage you to poke at that a little bit. There are a number of entities that we've worked with that are larger that also have policies in place for prompter payment for smaller businesses. So businesses under a certain dollar amount size or a number of people. And so if you get a contract that has a much longer payment schedule than really works for your cash flow, and you're really wanting to get paid on a monthly basis, I would encourage you to ask if an entity has a prompter payment schedule, a prompter payment policy in place for smaller businesses or sole proprietors. And if that's the case, to really see if you can meet those requirements so that you can be paid on a more reasonable schedule that works with your business and works with your cash flow. So really encouraging you to keep that in mind when you think about the payment schedules when you're the, the, the con consultant or individual working with a larger entity or client. The other thing I would say is that I'm not sure I can't see your faces or ask you questions, you know, when you walk into a room, you usually walk around and ask a few questions. So I'm not sure who's all here today. But if you are somebody who takes on projects and you work with others where you have subcontractors or subconsultants, would also really encourage you to think about those payment schedules. So if you have a client and they have a 60 or 90 day turn time for when they're going to pay you. When you contract with your subcontractors, really keep in mind the turn time for when you'll get paid and then when you can actually pay them. And one example for this, I used to work in government specifically around contract compliance and contract enforcement. And so in those times, there were a lot of people that we had coming through who worked um, in construction and we would get a ton of different calls, especially on the human rights side where people are saying, well, we just haven't been paid and now all my contractors are wanting to get paid and I can't pay them because we don't have the cash flow and we don't have enough to float and it's been over 60 days. And so really to encourage you too, that if you have a, a period of time with your client that say 60 days to ensure that your contracts take that into consideration, your subcontracts that you have for anybody working underneath you as well, so that they're not knocking at your door to get paid in 10 days and you're not gonna get paid for another 60 days. To really have that honest conversation and think about those clauses that are in your contracts as well. And so that's something I really seek to pay everybody that we work with and team with within 30 days because everything we try to do on a monthly schedule. But if we have a larger opportunity or client that comes in and their turn time is going to be much longer, then we have that honest conversation when we make our contracts to manage expectations. Um, the other thing that I would say in terms of payment schedules is to keep in mind, again, getting paid really important. So imagine that you have a project or a client and you put in your contract that payments need to happen every 30 or 35 days, and it's now 60 days and they haven't paid. So there's an opportunity there in your contract. That's a breach. You've agreed that they're going to pay in 30, 35 days and they haven't. That's a term in your contract that you can enforce to ensure that you're able to get paid. And one thing that we've done, something that I did, and this is with my business owner hat and learning from others, is putting in terms in that contract that, okay, so you don't pay within 35 days. That's cool. Then you're going to get a 1% charge on top of that for every late fee. <laughs> and you have, you don't have to enforce it, but you have it there as a tool to protect you. And I hoped as a relational person, I would never, ever have to do that. In my life, I have. <laughs> And, and when it got to that point as a relational person, I was really like, oh, I don't want to, I don't have to be that person and say that if you're somebody who those are difficult conversations to have. Another thing that we included in that term and clause was to say that if you're going to have late payments and we have to enforce this, then the client is responsible for any additional costs to have to enforce it or legal fees if you have to go to court. And that way, if you do have to hire somebody to advocate for you to get paid, then it's already in your contract that you're covered and that those costs are covered and it's not another hit for you. So really pay attention to what you have on your payment schedules and clauses. Um, and zipping through the other parts of this um, to touch base on a few things here, upfront costs something to think about. So another story and then an example for upfront costs. I had a client that we've worked with many, many times before. 
And with that client had come to learn that as much as we can contract, that they had such a large bureaucratic system in place for payment that it could take months before they would pay. And they always felt terrible about it, but it just took forever. So something that we learned to put in our contracts is that at the time of contracting, we're gonna bill right away. And we had a certain percentage that we're going to bill or we're gonna bill right away for materials. Those are terms that you can put in your contract. So if you know you're working with somebody that's gonna take a while to pay you, that at least you know upfront, okay, this, this money's gonna come in, I'll be able to buy my supplies and materials and take care of all of those things in advance. Another thing to keep in mind, invoice processing. If you are working with public entities, Every entity is different and sometimes it changes with people in terms of the processing. I just wanna flag for you when you look at contracts to ensure that if there's a clause on there in terms of how you're supposed to invoice, that you look really closely at all the things that you need to include in your invoice. Some entities invoices will require that you have to put the purchase order number in there and that you have to identify the department and the person. And if you don't do those things, then it slows down your payment and it often has some language like, if these things are not completed, then your payment may be delayed. And it has no date, no turn time, so you have no idea how long it could be delayed. So really pay attention to that language and something that I've learned in my career at the front end, as soon as the contract comes, I have this, this whole email that's already drafted and saved in a Word doc that says, here are all my questions about your invoicing process. Please, could you answer these questions so we get these things set up? Do you do direct deposit? Do you do cash? Is there a person we need to include on the invoice? All these different things that are really important to cover on the front end so that you're good to go. Um, so the next piece, termination clause, and I will, I promise, dip through these last pieces. I know we have other folks coming up in time, 15 minutes goes fast. So in terms of a termination clause, what I'll say with this to connect to the payment is that for no cause, that happens. Sometimes life changes. Every contract that you have will have some kind of termination clause. And if you're creating your own or working with somebody, really encouraging you to have both of these. So if there's no cause, that's like life changes. Somebody got a job, they've moved on, or you something happened and you're not gonna work anymore. Put in a clause that really says, you know, as long as you've given notice within 10 business days or something, you can move forward. So those are the, the light and fluffy kind of instances. For cause, those are usually much longer sections. And so what I would say to flag for you in terms of termination for clause is when you read the termination clause within your contract, look to see if there's language included in there related to um, if they'll pay for ter termination, they'll pay you through the last deliverable. Um, and that's that. And we're not responsible to pay for things that we're not happy with at that point. So in terms of connecting to that compensation piece, what I would encourage you to really pay attention to is when you're scoping out your work, is it that you wanna scope by deliverables or hourly rate, depending on the nature of work that you're doing? Because if things are tied to deliverables and you've worked 400 hours on something and you haven't given a deliverable and they decide, hey, we don't actually like this, we're just gonna terminate because we want to now, um, then you're not getting paid. <laughs> and so when you scope things out, encouraging you to think about if you think about your cash flow and you need things on a monthly basis, then think about your deliverables on a monthly basis. Um, I tend to try to always do hourly with the nature of our work. So that way we do do things hourly and on a monthly basis. But if anything were to ever happen, we're still gonna get paid for the hard work that we put in. So really encouraging people to think about that. We could talk about termination over coffee a little bit more, but we have to zip along. <laughs> and so the last piece here I'm gonna quick touch on is intellectual property and credit clauses. Um, really with IP, what I would highlight, something that I've done since I was like 12 or 13 is anytime I create a creative work, I copyright that thing as soon as it's done. And so that's really important because within some of these contracts, they'll say you're hired work for hire. So whatever you create is gonna be theirs. But a lot of contracts also after that have a clause saying that any pre-existing intellectual property that you have will remain yours and you're good to go. So if on a project you're using things that you've created before, you want to make sure that that's protected. So then it's included in that this is your work, this is what you've created. And then that directly connects to the credit clause that I put in all the contracts is if I've created something and you're going to put it out there in the world, I want to make sure that you're saying, hey, we worked with Strong and Starlike <laughs> and they're the folks who did this. And so if you're creating anything, really think about including a clause that says that you need to be getting that credit. And so lastly, just a few quick resources that are free for you. Um, there are a ton. 
that are usually community specific, but these are just three. I really encourage you to look at Legal Corps. They're free. It's an organization that offers pro bono legal advice for business owners, nonprofits, inventors, and creators. And so they do free um, brief advice clinics at CERT monthly workshops that happen. Um, well, now they're all virtual, but happened in St. Paul <laughs> previously, where you can sit down with an attorney for a brief advice clinic. SCORE also connects with Legal Corps and they offer free business advice. So these are just three resources and tools that could be helpful for you. So with that, I'm gonna say thank you and I'm going to pass it on to the next speaker. Thank you, Tasijra. I'm gonna send it over to Aaron, but I just wanted to tell you really quick that I will give a follow-up email and then send some links that's been shared and as well as all the panelists' email address. So um, no epic handwriting of HTTM, da 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 da. Okay, I will send that to you later. Um, now I'm gonna send it over to Aaron. Thank you. Thank you. I'm also gonna share my screen here. And I'm here to talk about permits. I'm an independent public artist. Here I am um, in Lanesboro, Minnesota, doing a public art project. I'm also the producer of the Northern Spark Festival, which you may have seen in either Minneapolis or St. Paul, or sometimes simultaneously both. And I'm the artistic director of Art Shanty Projects. You can find us on the middle of a frozen lake in January and February. So um, I wanted to just start out with some really big picture notes on permits that I have learned over the years as I have navigated all of these very complicated uh, structures and systems. The first thing is that every city is different. So different places, may have different permits, different costs, different timelines, different processes. So just know that if you're moving from Minneapolis to St. Paul with the project, you have to relearn the system. Um, also, even within one city, different departments work differently. So they might have a different payment method. Literally, you may have to hand deliver a check to the health department, but you can call and get a sound permit credit card um, taken over the phone. Um, they also have different timelines. So really you cannot expect everything to be due on the same timeline. You, I really recommend that you do your research and your planning well in advance and set up a timeline for yourself that includes all of the different permits that you might need. Um, not everything is always accessible or obvious on city websites. So the phone is your friend, make those phone calls. Talk, make friends with the people in the departments, they will help you find the answers that you need. Um, there are permits for all kinds of wild things, but I have tried to distill this presentation into the elements of your art projects or events or performances in public space that might be most common. I'm not gonna read through this list right now, um, but we will go through all these things. Again, Aki will be sending out a link to this um, presentation. So we'll start with use of space, which in my world usually includes things like parks, water, sidewalks, streets, parking spaces, and private property. In Minneapolis, there's a really simple permit application for um, using a park. I've included a website here. Um, I also just want to note that not every single park within the city limits of Minneapolis is under the Parks and Rec uh, Department. There are some private parks that you would have to go to a private entity for. So a really good example of that is Gold Medal Park, which is by the river next to the Guthrie Theater. St. Paul works slightly differently and your cost will range depending on the number of people at your event. Um, I'm using the term event really loosely. I know that I'm coming from an event world with festivals. Your event might be a performance. Um, also St. Paul, depending on the area of the city, you may need to go through a different process. And there are additional fees for a lot of things. So if you want a 10 by 10 pop-up tent, they're gonna charge you to have it in the space, for instance. 
However, if you're a nonprofit or you have a nonprofit that you're working with, you can get discounts on all these things. Also, if you're doing something really, really huge, there's a whole big process that I'm not going to get into today. Uh, but if you have burning questions about that, I welcome you to contact me separately and I can share more. Um, lakes, if you're going to do something on a lake, whether it's flowing or frozen water, you will need to get a permit from the Hennepin County Water Patrol. I was actually just speaking this afternoon with the founder of Art Shanty Projects, and he was telling me the first year that they did it, they set up their one shanty and didn't know they needed a permit, and the sheriff came by. <laughs> and they worked it out. Uh, usually these situations are pretty friendly, especially for artists when we're doing very bizarre things, and it's uh, often understood that we didn't know that we needed a permit. This is really simple application. It's free. I encourage you to do more project on uh, projects on water. <laughs> um, so another space you might need to use is some sort of right away. This might be if you are painting a mural on the side of a building and you need to put up scaffolding so you can paint and you're on the sidewalk, you need an obstruction permit for that. Or if you want to put porta potties somewhere, or if you need to load things in and out and you want to reserve parking spaces. It's a pretty simple process. Um, the city of Minneapolis, there's this rowway website where they have a little map you can zoom in and you like mark online exactly where you want your porta potties to go and you submit it that way. St. Paul's a little more old school. Um, it used to be that you have to physically show up in the office. Um, now it's all online because of COVID. I don't know how that will change in the future. Again, if you're doing something gigantic in Minneapolis, you may need a block event or special event permit. Again, I'm not gonna get into that today, but it's a really fun process where you go to this meeting with all of the um, heads of these different city departments and pitch your project. And then they help you figure out what you need. Um, sometimes we want to do projects on private property. Um, usually all that requires, again, is like a relationship, a phone call, showing up, expressing interest and curiosity and forming some sort of partnership. Um, I do recommend coming up with a partnership or in-kind sponsor agreement. Sometimes, like in this case with Bread and Pickle, they just wanted us to do a bunch of shout outs on social media to use this space. Um, I think it's important to remember that you sometimes we're compelled to just go do guerrilla style art in a public space but then we don't realize that the electrical boxes are locked and we need power. So hot tip, get permission so you can get someone to unlock the electricity for you. Uh, maybe you're using that electricity for amplified sound. That's often the case. In Minneapolis, the, this is just a little screen grab from the bottom of the permit with the costs for it. It's really simple and you only need five business days in advance to submit it pretty slick and easy. St. Paul is much more complicated. Um, in order to get the variance, which is the standard process, it takes 60 days. So they go through a neighborhood notification process and then they actually take it to the city council for a vote. Uh, it's very official and it costs $175. And there's the website if you wanna go through that process. But I also am very, uh, happy to share with you there's an alternative to that, which is called the sound level exemption, but it ha you have to be sponsored by a local neighborhood nonprofit. So it needs to be a nonprofit in the geographic area of where you're doing your event that you want to use sound. It's free, it's fast, it's easy, it's very secret, except right now I'm going to tell you to please tell all of your friends about it because I, I want more people to utilize this resource. You do have to make a phone call. So you have to call DSI and explain what you're doing and you know who you are, and then they'll send you the paperwork for it. This paperwork is not available on the city website on its own. Then of course, maybe you wanna light things on fire. 
I don't know what your project is. <laughs> uh, with the city of Minneapolis, this is just a little fee schedule screen grab of the cost of various types of fire you might use creatively. And um, there's the website link. I also just want to mention that sometimes you just need permission. You don't actually need a permit. So an example of this with art shanties in 2020 is that we wanted to have a sauna on the lake. And of course, they wanted to burn wood. And so I called up the fire inspector and asked about it because it didn't really fit under any of those categories. And I had to send photos of the wood burning stove and the plan and they were very happy to send an email saying you have permission to do this. You don't need a permit. Save this email in case anybody questions you on it. And it was that quick and easy. Um, I guess I'll mention I have never had a fire permit in St. Paul before, so I can't speak to that. Um, then the last thing I really want to talk about are food and beverages, and I'm talking specifically non-alcoholic beverages. Uh, if you are giving food to the public in any way, you will need permits. This includes if the food is part of your project. If you're having a story circle and you want to share tea or food, you need a permit to do that. If the food is for back of house use only, it's your own personal snack, it's something you want to share with your collaborators or any volunteers you might have, you do not need a permit for that. Again, the two cities work a little bit differently on food. Minneapolis, you need at least two weeks in advance to submit this. Um, those are the main categories that we have with permits. I do want to take a moment to just get real about what kind of project you might be doing. Maybe it's very tiny and you have a very small budget and all of these permits are very expensive and overwhelming. So think about if you can afford it or not. Consider the elements that you want to use that might require permitting and maybe you want to scale down or adjust your project so that you just need permission, not a permit. And then also, of course, consider the risk of not having a permit. Um, are you willing to accept that risk? Risk. How does it impact other people involved, whether it's collaborators or partners or neighbors, et cetera? Um, and my final suggestions are, are don't let permits be an obstacle to prevent you from making art in public space. Get creative, you're all artists, learn the rules, work around them, work with them, be reasonable and make smart choices, make sure everyone's comfortable. And as with anything in life, approach permits with curiosity, ask questions, and oftentimes you will get really helpful answers. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. I'm just taking it in, both Tisidra and Erin both talked about relationship building. And I feel like when you hear contract or permit, it feels like something a little bit scary, but I, I feel like that, oh yeah, I'm gonna go in with the curiosity. That's like really nice lesson. So I appreciate that a lot. So now I'm gonna give it to Greg. I'm pretty sure tax is not about relationship, but... <laughs> <laughs> that would be a definitely a great lesson. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Greg. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm, um, my name is Greg, uh, talking about the next scary thing, uh, which is uh, taxes. Uh, and the next, uh, probably the top three things that artists love to deal with, right, is taxes, uh, law, <laughs> anything legal, uh, and anything related to permits. So uh, congratulations, everybody. I'm next. Um, I'm going to share my screen as well here. Um, everybody, everybody here. Um, yeah, so uh, we're, yeah, we're talking about taxes uh, in this uh, 15 minute portion here. I'm going to really dial it down into kind of like the basics of what we're going to be talking about here as well. Uh, but to kind of start it out, I want to uh, introduce myself. My name is Greg Mann. I am an accountant at Fox Tax in uh, Northeast. Um, if you're unfamiliar with Fox Tax, you've been open for about 15, 16, 17 years, somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, primarily servicing artists, certainly started uh, primarily servicing uh, artists in the uh, creative industry in the Twin Cities area, has then since branched out to 
any number of different states that wanted to work with us. Uh, and then as many of, uh, as any of uh, other industries as well, but with the primary focus uh, on uh, artists in that creative industry. I've been doing taxes now for um, 10, 15, I don't know, a bunch of years. And uh, the <laughs> coming fresh off of a very long tax season. So I am happy to be here talking about anything that isn't actually doing a tax return. Um, what, uh, please ask questions as we're going through all of this. I'm gonna try to dial it down. Taxes are a very broad topic. Um, and uh, what I'm gonna try to focus in on is what things are gonna be uh, helpful to you uh, as a creative uh, industry, somebody who is gonna be finding a webinar with forecasts. Uh, and, um, uh, but yeah, ask questions. If, uh, just hop on that q and if you have any specific questions, I'll try to address them as, as time see fit, sees fit. Um, we're going to be trying to talk about uh, today, I guess I should probably start, I really like that Cedra with the disclaimer, this is not uh, legal tax advice, uh, <laughs> or something, I don't know what the right word, what the lawyer words should be there, uh, but I'm only consulting on the things that you, you can or cannot do, I'm not giving you uh, tax advice on how to pre actually prepare uh, your taxes. Um, also, I had another disclaimer too that I thought of, but I, it was funny, it wasn't actually a real one. I'll, it'll come back to me. Um, in the meantime, here's what we're going to be talking about. I want to touch on the straight up basics on taxes. It's just a refresher for everybody on what really we're talking about here. And then I want to move into also what uh, grants are and what that, especially in the world of forecast is super helpful with the springboard. I know our chanties as well. All There's a, a, a big focus on grants and what that means for your taxes. Um, and then we'll kind of round it all out with, with as you're doing this thing that you're doing um, as an artist, as an individual, as just a small business, uh, what that entity type is that you want to be focusing on, what you want to be considering, um, and what it means for you as a, uh, an individual or as a partnership or collective or uh, as a business. So I'll just kind of jump right into it. Um, this is just a straight up basics of self-employed business, right? You are an artist. You just made some money, right? You went into the world, you made some money. Let's say you made $5,000 over the course of the year doing something. Let's use an example of a photographer. You're a photographer, you sold $5,000 worth of stuff, uh, but it costs you $3,000 to get there. That gets you to a net profit, right? Of $2,000. You're not getting taxed on five grand, the five grand that you made, you're getting taxed on the $2,000, right? It's just whatever's left over that net profit. Same story, but maybe with more expenses. Let's say you made that same $5,000 and you spent six to get there on qualifying deductible expenses. Uh, this leads you to a negative number, which is considered a net loss. The next basic thing with taxes, the 1040 tax return has all of your income on it, right? Let's say your W-2 job and you also have a self-employed business. You've got other taxable income. If you've got $2,000 in net profit, that just gets tacked on as taxable income, right? But if you've got a negative number here, this negative $1,000, that actually reduces the other taxable income that you have on your other sources, which if you're thinking about this, sounds great, right? Like, yeah, obviously you want to operate at a loss every single year because it reduces your taxes on everything else. Sounds like a great idea. Yeah, true. That is a pretty great idea, but the IRS doesn't think that it's a great idea because technically you're taking money out of their pocket at that point, you know, because they're expecting taxes on everything else and your loss is actually reducing the amount of taxes they're getting from that. So they set up these kind of um, uh, rules in a way, but essentially two terms that they've come up with, which is a uh, hobby uh, and business, um, which uh, I don't love. I don't love the word hobby, uh, especially when talking to artists, try to tell an artist who's been doing art for 30 years, um, that what they're doing is a hobby. It's offensive. <laughs> and I've actually, I remember my first year doing taxes for artists, I just threw it out there. It's just like, yeah, you're, you're probably looking more like a hobby. I got an earful on that one. So it was a great point because it's, so now I don't use, I don't prefer those words. I prefer what they mean, which is really just seeking profit and not seeking profit. If you can prove to the IRS that what you're doing is seeking profit and maybe showing profit and maybe paying taxes on that profit, then what you can do as a business is do the things here, like reduce your taxable income by that amount, by the 3,000 or by the 6,000, because you're operating as a business. The IRS allows you to do that as a business. But if what you're doing is actually considered a hobby or if the IRS deems you as a hobby, 
then those expenses are actually not deductible in the same way. You're only limited to what you bought and sold. Any of the other deductible expenses are, uh, are gone. Actually, I'm reminded of my disclaimer now. I've got a two-year-old who's going to be coming home any minute. She usually comes in blasting when she comes home, so I apologize in advance if she does. That was my disclaimer. So now, back to it. Uh, so the, hobby, the reason I'm bringing up the hobby versus business is the only time that that really becomes an issue when filing your taxes is if you're doing that second example here, this loss example, consistently every single year. The IRS looks at that and says, hold up a second. Is this thing that you're doing here actually seeking profit or are you doing a hobby or not seeking profit? Uh, and they would reach out to you in an audit, uh, which I know is a but scary buzzword, but ultimately it's not that big of a deal if all of your ducks are in a row, you've got all your records and all of your things are, uh, you can prove everything with receipts and everything's not the end of the world. But an audit would potentially occur. And in the course of that audit, if they deem uh, what you uh, are doing as a hobby and not a business, they go back through all those years and the majority of those years that you've been deducting those losses. And potentially you'd have to lose those expenses and pay taxes on all of the income that you were maybe reducing using those deductible expenses as a business in the past, which is not ideal. Right. So um, at Fox Tax, we have a lot of artists, uh, musicians, artists, creative folk, uh, who a lot of times you're kind of playing with that line, uh, which is you may have a number of years in which in order to make the money that you're making, you've got to shell out some money in order to do so, which puts you at this potential risk of reporting losses each year. So the general rule of thumb, which I think is my next slide here, is that the IRS wants to see a profit in three out of the most recent five years of doing a business. It's a general rule of thumb. If you can maintain that, your audit liability is super low, pretty good, actually. Um, uh, if it's not the case, let's say you're reporting losses every single year, but you argue that you are actually a business, it just so happens that your business is operating a loss every year, you can prove it and come out on top of that audit by showing these kind of this specific list of specific rules uh, that uh, if you can satisfy is true, you might be able to, you could probably get out of this audit scot-free and still be able to deduct those losses. And that's things like uh, you, this activity that you're doing is carried out in a business-like manner. You have a certain uh, expertise that allows you to do this. Time and effort expanded into this, uh, this thing is um, uh, uh, substantial. Uh, essentially, this is the thing that you do. There's a, a, a good list of nine of them. And I, it, this will we'll follow up with a handout um, after this that has uh, this list on it. It actually comes from this super interesting Forbes article about this uh, professor in New York who was taking 30 years of losses. Uh, it's actually super exciting. I mean, it's a tax law, so it's exciting to nobody else but me, probably. But it's super exciting because she came out on top. It was just like, she won. She, she beat the government uh, in that uh, they created this nice set of rules that the IRS in the tax court case said, like, as long as you can provide that this is the case, then sure, yeah, okay, losses, whatever. But you'd have to be able to maintain it. So there's a great article on it, and we'll follow up in the handout about it after the fact. Um, and I don't want to beat a dead horse with um, hobby business because it's a pretty big topic that has a whole bunch of pages of tax court cases on it. But I wanted to note that because it's a very important thing uh, when you are an artist doing taxes because it happens. Losses happen. It's not the end of the world. Uh, but just uh, want to make sure that you're kind of maybe playing with some profit uh, a, a few years just to maybe keep your IRS off the back. Um, yeah, um, so that's, that's I don't want to go too far into that. Um, I guess before we get into starting a business, I want to talk a little bit about grants, right? So this is a big one for, uh, for self-employed people. And this example that I was saying before, this photographer makes $5,000 selling photos, uh, maybe shooting weddings, uh, et cetera, made $5,000. Uh, it's actually the same if you uh, were to be receiving grants most of the time. 97% of grants are taxable income like a self-employed business would be, especially receiving the grant as a self-employed person. Like uh, Minnesota State, State Arts Board grants are typically uh, taxable as, uh, as self-employment income, as is this. Um, a lot of the uh, most recent uh, stimulus 
COVID related grants. Springboard had a bunch that went out. I think, yeah, yeah. Uh, that those are all the same kind of self employment, taxable income. A lot of times, though, with grants, uh, you apply for them with expenses in mind. You're saying, I need this grant because I'm doing this project. And this project has XYZ expenses that I need. And that's the reason I'm asking for this money, right? So usually those XYZ expenses are probably going to be deductible expenses against your income, right? So if you get, let's say you get a $10,000 grant. Wonderful. That's great. If your $10,000, all of it is slated for expenses for your project, for whatever it is that you're uh, applying for the grant for, make sure that those expenses happen in the year that you get that money. It is calendar year based. So if you get 10 grand, make sure it's spent before December 31st so you can deduct it all in that year so you don't end up having to pay a tax on a chunk that maybe was left over and moved into the next year. Um, that's a big one that uh, used to be a really big issue in the past. U of M used to issue out grants on like December 15th. It's ridiculous. Like you have two weeks to spend however much money that you had or else you lose a chunk of it. Um, now, typically a lot of grants are issued out during the year. So at least I have a little bit of time. If there is a portion of that grant that's slated to pay you, uh, so essentially take home to you, uh, that's the portion that's that you're going to pay tax on. That's your going to be your profit that's left over after your other deductible expenses. That um, uh, would be the taxable portion on that. So that's grants. Um, I want to touch on now the uh, what it means to um, operate as a business on your taxes in the eyes of the IRS. Uh, the most common form of entity selection, which isn't even really an entity selection is the sole proprietor. That is when you, yourself, your social security number in your name makes money uh, as a freelance self-employed contractor, all synonymous. So essentially getting money that is untaxed, 1099 income or whatever, cash. That is self-proprietor. What you do is you report it on a, what's called a Schedule C that deducts, you report the total income, deduct all your expenses, and then come to that net profit number. Super straightforward, excuse me, in quotes, straightforward as taxes are straightforward, but the most straightforward uh, way to do it is that sole proprietorship. And also probably the most common, I would say probably 60% of my clients are sole proprietors. That might be high, let's say 40. The next step up from that sole proprietorship is the limited liability company. Um, and I'm sure Tzedra can speak to this a little bit more. There's only so much I actually can legally speak to it, uh, but it's uh, essentially stating that it, it, you file it with the Secretary of State in the state in which you are operating. So Minnesota Secretary of State, let's say if you're in Minnesota, it's 155 bucks, one-time fee uh, that you don't have to pay anymore as long as you renew it online. Uh, and what you're doing is you're putting your business name down with an LLC tacked onto the end of it, and uh, that is now your LLC as a single member, which allows you to, uh, it affords you the legal protection, the same legal protection that corporations get, or similar, excuse me, uh, uh, legal protection that corporations get uh, without having to actually incorporate. Uh, it, it, from a tax filing perspective, there's no difference between an LLC and a sole proprietorship. Both of them are filled out on a Schedule C uh, in the same way income, deductions, profit, that flows to your 1040. Um, they're both what's called disregarded entities, which is just a bummer word uh, for stating that your business and your personal are one and the same, really. Um, so let's say, uh, yep, okay, let's say that the LLC that you wanted to create was with one other person uh, and you wanted to create what's called a multi-member LLC. In the state of Minnesota, if you do this, um, you are automatically deemed a partnership in the eyes of uh, the IRS, which means that you have now created an entity. A partnership is an entity. And that has its own tax filing. It's called Form 1065, which does more or less the same thing as the Schedule C does, income, deductions, profit. Uh, but then that profit is then split out uh, into each individual partner, whatever their partnership share is, and then they report their partnership shares individually on their own income taxes. It's called a pass-through entity. The partnership doesn't pay any taxes. Each individual partner is the person on the hook for the taxes. Now, partnerships are great if you want to get into something with another person or multiple other people and you wanted it to be cut and dry. Who does what? Who puts in what money? 
uh, who gets out of it, whatever. Um, but if you're going to do it, do it. Like, talk to a lawyer, maybe email to Cedra and say, hey, I am going to be setting up this partnership. We'd like to set up a partnership agreement and get one in writing so that everything's clear. You're getting into something with your buddies or friends or people that you enjoy their company with. If a partnership doesn't go in a way that you wanted it to, or maybe there's a disagreement, you might not be buddies after the fact. The best partnership agreement is one that you write and you put in a file cabinet and you don't, never have to look at it again until you need it, right? So definitely recommend getting one of those if you take that route. Um, the next one down there is the C Corporation. That one's Best Buy, Target, giant places that need more than 100 shareholders, not for you. But to note, in Minnesota, there's this thing called the General Benefit Corporation. I don't know if you've heard this one. I don't recommend it. It, it's, it, the reason I don't recommend it is because the IRS doesn't deem it as an entity selection yet. So they automatically call you a C-Corp and C-Corps are taxed twice. Uh, so it's double tax on something. It costs way more to file. Uh, it's not ideal. Um, the idea of a general benefit corporation is that you are stating that your company is something of general benefit. You could also just do that as an LLC and say that, hey, I'm Greg Mann LLC. I believe in community <laughs> or something, you know, like you don't have to get the GBC to do it. I don't love it from a tax perspective. There might be other reasons. If there's $50,000 in grants that you can get it for doing it, that wasn't going to be available otherwise, maybe, yeah, sure, I could see the benefit. But otherwise, be wary of those ones. And then the last one is an S-Corp. And then S-Corp, bankers love setting people up for S-Corps, but they're costly. I typically don't recommend S-Corps until your profit is six figures or higher. So after expenses, that's what you're making is six figures or higher. It costs a lot. There's a huge tax savings, but it's way bigger of a cost to run an S-Corp uh, until you hit that threshold. And if you want to know more about S-Corps, feel free to email me later and we can chat about it. I always recommend if you're going to do that route, talk to a tax professional, talk to lawyers, uh, and, and figure out a game plan because it's a great entity selection, but not to go into lightly. Um, so that's your entity choices. There's going to be a follow-up handout to kind of walk through those ones as well as, uh, the rest of it. Oh, that's a bonus thing. I need to leave that one in there. Uh, and this is my information because I believe my 15 minutes are up. Uh, my shameless plug is that if you as an artist, as an individual are doing your own taxes, big fan of that. I love that. If you're going to dive in, spend the time to figure out the tax laws, make sure you're doing what's right for you and for your business and what you love. That's wonderful. But if the amount of time and stress uh, is uh, a waste to you, like it's just like I, it, you hate it and you have zero interest in it, or you're going to make more money doing something else entirely, and that includes happiness dollars, that's when tax accountants start to make a little bit more sense. So that's my shameless plug. And if you're interested in working with Fox Tax, please check out our website. There's also a whole bunch of resources on the website uh, as well, uh, including a wait list for uh, becoming a client. So thank you. Thank you. And you know, I'm Fortunately, or, or maybe fortunately, like you all covered a lot of ground. That means it's six o'clock. <laughs> and I am going to share like that uh, Tessidra and Aaron and Greg all are uh, graciously agreed with me that sharing the personal information. So um, the email address will be coming to you. So if you have a Q&A, please send them the questions directly. So you could have a quick email conversations about what you're wondering, because I'm sure you have a lot of questions and I have a list of questions as well after listening to it. But I'm just gonna say, just honor the time and say thank you for coming and all the people who, um, you know, tune into the web webinar and then Aaron, Cedra, and Greg, thank you so much for being here to share all the information we all need it. Okay, well, this is the end of it. And should we, can we just unmute and say bye so we can hear your voice at the end? Thank you so much. Goodbye. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for hanging out. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. And everybody, thank you so much for coming to the workshop. Um, we'll talk with you all soon. Bye. All right.
by stopping.